Well, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, Minnesota, my hometown. They are, they are deep in the throes of winter back there. They got a little more snow here today. Is it snowing outside yet? <laughs> no, it's not. Okay. Boy, they've had more than their annual share already in Minnesota, and here it is just the middle of December. It turned warm this last week, got up into the 40s, and the snow in the front yards melted a little bit, but do you see those big piles that the plow has pushed up? That's going to be there until April. <laughs> That's going to stay until April. doesn't matter how warm that gets. That hard snow in the alley, that does not respond to warmth any more than most of the people in Lake Wobegon do. <laughs> that's, that's permanent there for a while. The big event this last week in town was uh, at the Chatterbox Cafe on Friday, yesterday, when Dorothy, for reasons known only to herself, made up a massive batch of rhubarb pie. Such great rhubarb pie, she used up 25 quarts of frozen rhubarb to make what she thought was going to be a week's supply of pies and her work be done. But word got around town fast and people started to come in and people came in for morning coffee and by 11 o'clock Friday morning every scrap of pie was eaten up. The most wonderful pie, rhubarb pie. Clarence Bunsen came in and had a piece of rhubarb pie with his coffee after breakfast, and uh, one piece just segued right into the next. <laughs> just brought tears to your eyes. It was so good. Rhubarb pie, so sweet, and with that faint, sour taste that we love so much. Rhubarb is a free vegetable. It grows everywhere like weeds and is only used in desserts, so far as I know. People pick it, they chop it up, they freeze it, they use it to make rhubarb pie. Nobody ever buys rhubarb in supermarkets. It's never advertised. I've never heard a rhubarb commercial. And that makes it unique. And because it's never advertised or promoted, there's no rhubarb council of America. It's trying to sell rhubarb apple juice or anything. Because it's never promoted, never advertised, it's free, nobody ever buys it. Rhubarb is strictly private, it's strictly local. And a child grows up believing that only in our town do we know about rhubarb. <laughs> this is our secret. Nobody else in America has this yet. Rhubarb pie. Lyle came down from high school for morning coffee. The rumors of rhubarb pie reached that far. He abandoned his 11th grade science class. He left them to, to work on Christmas gifts. They're, they're spatter painting the Milky Way against pieces of plywood. He left them working on it. And he came down to the Chatterbox Cafe and he had a piece of rhubarb pie. And then he had another slab of pie even though he's promised himself that he would lose 20 pounds before Christmas. <laughs> he promised himself that way back in October. And now he's got about 25 pounds to lose. <laughs> Only way he can make his goal is to have his leg amputated. But he sat and he had that piece of rhubarb pie, the second piece. And it was so good that when he went back up to school, he looked it up in the dictionary behind his desk as the children were spatter painting the Milky Way. He looked up rhubarb and found that it was a member of the buckwheat family. Rhubarb, buckwheat, and smartweed and uh, rope weed are in there as well. A family of herbaceous plants characterized by swollen joints and by small leafless flowers and by dry indehiscent fruit. So, of course, he had to look up indehiscent. <laughs> and indehiscent, the dictionary defined as not dehiscent. <laughs> so, he looked up dehiscent. And dehiscence refers to fruit bursting when it becomes ripe 
and releasing the seeds. That's dehiscent fruit. Rhubarb and the members of the buckwheat family have indehiscent fruit, the small, dry seeds that do not burst. If you were to characterize Norwegian Lutherans as <laughs> dehiscent or indehiscent, <laughs> I believe that indehiscent is the word that would spring <laughs> to mind, small, dry, holding on to the seeds. Most Norwegian Lutherans would consider dehiscence to be indecent, and <laughs> they hang on to their seed pretty tightly. <laughs> Mr. Berge came up to uh, the Chatterbox Cafe. He came over from the sidetrack tap, and he came in and sat down at the counter of the Chatterbox Cafe, and he had a piece of rhubarb pie. And in the end, he had four pieces of rhubarb pie. It was so good, it brought tears to your eyes. He had two with ice cream and two straight up, and they were so <laughs> delicious. He looked up at Dorothy with tears of gratitude, and he said, damn, this is good. <laughs> and she said, I don't want none of your profanity in here. She said, I don't want any of your dirty talk. You know how I feel about it. Just leave your dirty talk out on the sidewalk. You come in here, I'm tired of men and their dirty stories. She was wiping the counter. She's going whoop, 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 wiping down this counter. He looked at her. He thought to himself, how is it that a prudish, narrow-minded person like Dorothy can make such obscenely good rhubarb pie? <laughs> How is it? He tried to humor her out of it. He said, damn, he said, that's the name of this new organization they have. Haven't you ever heard of that? DAM, D-A-M, it stands for Mothers Against Dyslexia. <laughs> well, she didn't think that was so funny either. She did not laugh at that. She was in no mood for humor. Evidently, the baking of all of these rhubarb pies had absolutely exhausted her. And the fact is that Dorothy does not care for rhubarb pie. This is the amazing thing, is that the woman who can make the best rhubarb pie west of the Mississippi doesn't care for it. She prefers pumpkin. If you can imagine that, pumpkin pie. Pumpkin pie is a synonym for mediocrity. Pumpkin pies are there. No, they're nothing but mediocre. The worst pumpkin pie you ever ate wasn't that much worse than the best pumpkin pie you ever ate. It's all, it's all in the middle. It's just pumpkin. It's just a lump of squash. Pumpkin pie is nothing but an excuse to eat nutmeg. That's the only thing it is. It's a vehicle for nutmeg and clove and cinnamon. That's all it is. Rhubarb pie, there's nothing like it this wild vegetable that is purely local, it's secret, the vegetable of our childhood. In fact, it was discovered <laughs> in Minnesota. It was discovered by Norwegians, by, by two Norwegians, Rudy and Barb Gustafsson. <laughs> and they found it in their backyard in Bemidji in 1933. Rudy and Barb, and uh, nobody else had paid any attention to rhubarb. The Indians had overlooked it, the French, the Italians, the Irish, because it was so bitterly sour. But to Norwegians, sourness was no problem. <laughs> or bitterness. Barb just picked it and she cut it up and she dumped a lot of sugar on it, which she tended to do often with things she didn't understand. And she put it in the oven, and gave it the compound name after themselves, rhubarb. In later years, the H was added on the advice of a consultant to give it, <laughs> to give it style or something. Well, they made an awful lot of money off the discovery of rhubarb, as you can imagine. They had rhubarb cookbooks, and they had rhubarb schools, and they promoted <laughs> rhubarb products, and they made a ton of money, and of course that led to problems, and uh, Rudy, his eye wandered, and uh, he met a young woman named Wanda, and 
he tried to rename the vegetable Rwanda. <laughs> and there was a big lawsuit about it. Barb brought a big lawsuit about it, which lasted for years, was bitter, was sour. It led to the other meaning of the word rhubarb, meaning a squabble. But that's all over now. It's all over now. It's all past. And what we have now is this beautiful, beautiful vegetable. So lovely. Except that Dorothy, the woman who makes the best rhubarb pie in town, does not herself care for what she makes. A great mystery. How can the bringer of such good things derive no enjoyment from them herself? It's like Pastor Inkvist up at Lake Wobegon Lutheran who strives every year to deliver to his congregation the Christmas that they know and they love and the smell of pine boughs in the sanctuary and all of the candles and the music, simple, familiar music, beautifully rendered, well rehearsed, and the sermons, simple and clear, and the Christmas story as we know it, not using the Christmas story as an excuse to harangue people in sort of a self-righteous way about the unmet needs of orphans in the third world, but simply to give them the Christmas story with the shepherds and the stable and the cattle and the stars and the wise men. And by midnight on Christmas Eve, when the church is dimmed and the children's choir sings from the back of the church, Alleluia, Alleluia. And when they hear that song, people weep. They sit in the dark and they cry. And these are people you never guessed had any liquid in them at all. <laughs> They sit there and they de-hiss these, <laughs> these indehissive people sit and de-hiss for the whole year, a whole year of weeping. But the man who's up in the pulpit, Pastor Inkvist, this tall, slope-shouldered, stooped man with a gray face, weary from weeks of Advent, stands up there and he simply cannot wait for it all to be over. And he just can go home. How is it that the bringer of good things stands with a wooden heart, unable to enjoy what everybody else enjoys? He just thinks about Florida, that's all. <laughs> He's just looking forward to Florida, to the trip to the Lutheran minister's retreat in January down in Florida. That Plymouth Fury that Judy Inkvist, his wife, is trying to sell to get $400 to help pay their fare down to Florida. She got an offer this last week from Minneapolis, a phone call. Somebody called her. She'd been asking $495, hoping to get $400 for a Plymouth Fury that runs pretty good most of the time. And the $400 would be enough to buy the plane tickets if they get them by December 21st so they can get the cheap tickets. And the phone call comes in and somebody offered $300. $300. She said, um, I'd really like to get $450, she said. And they said, oh, well, sorry. And they hung up. <laughs> they must have been Norwegians. That's how Norwegians negotiate. They don't. <laughs> they give you what they consider a fair offer. You don't accept it. They walk away. They're stunned that you wouldn't accept it. And then he got this amazing phone call on Wednesday from Florida. And he was offered a church down there, a new church. It's a mobile home church <laughs> in a mobile home park. And it would pay a little bit more than what he's getting now. And they live there in the park. And he would be preaching in a rather long, narrow church with <laughs> not as high a ceiling. But still, it would be in Florida. Now they could go there and get away from this town. And all of these dry, hard, indehiscent people. He kept this in his wooden heart as a secret 
until Friday morning he went down to the Chatterbox Cafe and he had a piece of rhubarb pie. It was the last one. Actually, the pie was all gone, but Dorothy had been keeping a piece in the fridge and when she took one look at Pastor Inkvist's gray face, she knew that he was the one who ought to have the last piece. She set it down on the counter alongside his coffee and he had a bite of it. And it was so good. Sweet, sweet pie with that faint, sour taste that gives it its flavor. She looked down at him, Dorothy. She said, people have been telling me it's pretty good. This woman who does not herself care for rhubarb pie at all, but who on every Christmas Eve sits in the back of the Lutheran church so that nobody can see her cry. Pastor Inkvist tasted it and tears ran down his cheek. It was so very, very good. He looked up at her and he said, do they have rhubarb in Florida? He said. She said, no. She said, rhubarb is only in Minnesota. Well, it has been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, especially now with almost all the storm windows on, people who have been keeping their voices down since April and May for fear of what the neighbors might think, are now able to express themselves fully and clearly to the people whom they live with, and the neighbors probably doing the same there. You gain one sort of privacy, though you lose another. Carl Krebsbach went out here the other day in his undershorts to get his pants off the clothesline and found out too late that the rain and the wind the day before had made the old maple tree in the backyard about as nude as he was. <laughs> Walked out in the yard and looked over and Suddenly there was Mrs. Cedarberg looking out her kitchen window. I tell you, she looked away so fast she could have broken her neck. <laughs> Carl jumped and ran back inside, put on a pair of pants, came out. She was out in the backyard covering her roses. <laughs> Said hello to him as if nothing had happened. And I guess nothing had, really. I don't know what's been happening in Lake Wobegon. I've been on the road and sort of been out of touch with events back there. Though, of course, when you come from a little town that time forgot, you don't have to stay real current, you know, to have a fairly good idea. I do find, though, that when I get away from it for even a short period of time, that everything seems to run together. and. Uh, I forget what year it is back there. <laughs> and people who have died a long time ago come back into the present in my mind. And it seems like a long time ago. I don't know, it's kind of confusing. But I was thinking that this was the time of year when people would slaughter back when people did that. Raleigh and Eunice Hochstetter, I think, were the last. They kept pigs, and they'd slaughter them in the fall because people always had. Going back to before refrigeration, they'd wait until the weather got cold so the meat would keep. And I went out to see the last, well, close to the last hog slaughter ever took place in Lake Wobegon when I was a kid. Went out with my cousin, along with my uncle, who was going to help Raleigh. People now, if they're going to slaughter an animal for meat to send it into the locker plant, pay to have the guys there do it, which I can understand. You slaughter pigs, it kind of takes away your appetite for pork for a while. Because <laughs> the pigs let you know that they don't care for it. <laughs> they don't care to be grabbed and dragged over to where the other pigs went and didn't come back. It was quite a thing for a kid to see, I tell you. It was quite a thing. 
to see living flesh and living insides of another creature. I would expect to be disgusted by it, but I wasn't. I was fascinated. I got as close as I could. Now, I know that some of you listening are probably eating dinner about now, and uh, <laughs> so I think I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. I think you ought to be able to enjoy your food without getting a full account of where it came from. But I'll just say that it was fascinating for a lot of reasons. And I remember that my cousin and I sort of got carried away in the excitement of it all, and we went down to the pig pen, and we were throwing rocks, little stones, at pigs to watch them jump and watch them squeal and run. And all of a sudden, I felt a big hand on my shoulder, and I was spun around, and my uncle's face was three inches away from mine. And he said, I ever see you do that again? I'll beat you till you can't stand up, you hear? And we heard. <laughs> I knew at the time that his anger had something to do with the slaughter. And I think that I understood it better back then than I do now as I try to put it into words. But I tell you, this was a ritual. It's all gone now. But it was a ritual. And it was done as a ritual. It was done swiftly. And there was no foolishness, no joking around, very little conversation. People went about their jobs, men and women, knowing exactly what to do. And always with respect for the animals that would become our food. And somehow, in some way, our throwing stones at pigs violated this ceremony and this ritual which they went through. It was a terrible violation of it, and we were terribly wrong. Raleigh was the last one to do it in town. One year he had an accident. The knife slipped, and an animal that was wounded got loose and ran across the yard before it fell. And he never kept pigs after that. He didn't feel he was worthy of it. And that's all gone. Children growing up in Lake Wobegon will never have a chance to see that. Adults going about a ritual of slaughter that goes back centuries. I remember the dog, Raleigh's dog Rex, was there. And he would he'd play with the pigs. He'd go out in the pen and chase them, and then he, they'd chase him for a while. That dog sat and cried. i never seen a dog cry before. That dog lay right there, big tears rolling down his cheeks, moaning. I went up to comfort him, and he turned away from me. It was a powerful experience that had life and death hung in the balance. And your family and all of them there. And now it's all gone like so much of that life that I saw a little bit of when I was a kid. A life in which people made do and which people made their own, lived off the land. They were independent on that account and lived between the ground and God. And you know, it's lost not only to this world, but also lost to memory. Because I can't bring it back, even in words. My memory is faulty, as everyone's is. And I think back to that life that's gone and those people. And I think about it as the olden days, the good old days when life was simple. And it's not true. It's a terrible disservice to them. Life was simple for me then because I was a child. 
and my happiness was looked after by other people. But it was not simple for the others. Never. And if I think, I can think of people who were terribly angry and people who were terribly hurt back on the farm. I think about Elizabeth June who lived back in Lake Wobegon on the farm with her parents. Back home they'd rather I didn't talk about this. They'd rather I presented a picture of Lake Wobegon as a sweet, simple place where people are kind and good to each other. But if I'd said that, a lot of people would want to go live there. And they wouldn't like that. And the people who'd go live there would be disappointed because it's not true. Elizabeth June was in her forties. She was not quite right, as they said. She was a little slow. She was also immense. Elizabeth June, the human balloon, we called her. <laughs> she was a woman of such loneliness that it hurt to look at her. So people didn't. And they didn't talk to her. And so she invented friends for herself out of the pages of the Sears Roebuck catalog where she saw them dressed in their fine clothes. And she put on parties with her friends out in the woods, her Sears Roebuck pals. Gracious parties in which they dressed up and they drank day queries. <laughs> Probably the only fancy drink she'd ever read about. And she talked to them out in the woods and then at home and then in church one Sunday morning when they were just about to pass the sacraments. She was heard to speak up and she said, Well, Roger, maybe I will buy that car. It was a part of a conversation that had begun somewhere else and was heading in another direction. Her mother shushed her up. But every Sunday she'd speak out, talking to her imaginary friends during church. We kids loved it, got a big kick out of her. We loved to see the Christian faith of our parents tested and tried before our eyes. <laughs> they didn't kick her out. Nobody said she shouldn't come. She stayed there for years, providing entertainment for us. Until one day, her rope came loose and her balloon drifted up to heaven where I'm sure she sits today on the right hand of the throne of God and has forgiven us all a long time ago. People would rather I didn't talk about that back home because there are some things you're not supposed to talk about to strangers, secrets you're supposed to keep within the family. But you know, over the years of doing this show, I've come to think of the people who listen to this show as being family, in a way, which is not true, <laughs> which is crazy, as a matter of fact. <laughs> On a level of craziness, it's right up there with Elizabeth June talking to her Sears Roebuck pals. <laughs> I'm as crazy as she is, or was, or is. I keep expecting to see her, maybe in Chicago. <laughs> She'd be old now. I look for her on the streets, even though I know she's dead. Old woman. She'd be coming down the street, pushing a grocery cart full of old clothes and Sears Roebuck catalogs, if I ever see her. I mean to give her some money, say a blessing, put my arm around her.
That's the news from Lake Wobegon, Minnesota. Where all the women are strong, including her. All the men are good looking. And all the children are above average. news in Lake Wobegon in my book took place just a few blocks from here up in St. Paul here this last week. A story that actually goes back many, many years, 20 some years when the Tollefson girl, Grace Tollefson, graduated from high school and much to the surprise of everyone, she was kind of quiet, and sensible person. She ran off with a strange man who came through town by the name of Campbell, who was a good-looking man with green eyes and sandy hair and loved to do magic tricks with quarters and napkins and loved to toss kids up in the air, but who seemed to have no prospects in this world and who was known to keep a bottle of whiskey in the trunk of his car when he came and to visit it on occasion. So it was over the opposition of the Tollefson family that Grace married him and became a Campbell and moved away from Lake Wobegon. And as the years went along, back came little bits of news that it was not a happy marriage. They had a child and then they had another and they had a third and then back came the news that he had left her. Actually, he had gone off on a binge and gotten drunk and she locked the door on him and he came back and then went away. And so there was nothing for her to do but to come back to town and to live off the charity of her family and the Lutheran Church. Her brother Lawrence got her a mobile home, an old green mobile home with plywood sides kind of cracked on the side and moved it into the yard behind his house by his garden. And the ladies from the church came and cleaned it up a little bit and they donated furniture. And people were sort of nice to him, but nice like you'd be nice to somebody who there was something wrong with. <laughs> they didn't have a father. And at that time in that town, it was like being a three-legged dog. It was just so unusual. And it was humiliating for her to walk down the streets and people look at her and she could see what they were thinking. They were thinking, we were right. We told you. Now look at you. Her oldest boy was Earl, her daughter was Marlis, and the little boy was Walter, who was so little he could not even really remember his father. And he didn't get much information around there. He asked his mother, about his father and she would only say that he was a handsome man and was descended from Scottish nobility and that he had a weakness, but it wasn't anybody's fault. He asked his grandma Tollefson about his father and she said, huh, those Campbells are all alike, wasn't one of them worth mentioning. But she said, it's not your fault, Walter. You didn't ask to be born into this world now, did you? He didn't ask again. Oh, it was kind of a sad family living there in that mobile home, living off charity. Every night after supper, all four of them would clear the table and do the dishes. And sometimes when she was feeling very good or when she was feeling very sad, she would say, Grace would say, well, She'd say, what are we going to do when our ship comes in? And that was everybody's cue to say what they'd do when they got rich. Well, they'd have a mansion in St. Paul. They'd have a big white mansion with a white fence around it. And they'd have a big crystal chandelier in the dining room. And they'd have fireplaces in the bedrooms. 
and it would be beautiful. It was beautiful carpets. Earl wanted a pony. He had simple tastes. He didn't want a pony. He wanted to ride his pony around the streets of St. Paul, bareback. <laughs> Marla, she wanted a big dollhouse. When the ship came in, she was going to have a big dollhouse for her dolls, Mr. and Mrs. Whippet, and their children. <laughs> and there'd be a swimming pool out behind it. And Walter, he sort of went along with all that. That's what they'd have when their ship came in. But one thing he didn't say, and that was that he knew that when the ship came in, his father would be in the bow, up there in a big white uniform, with a blue cap, with gold braid on it. Well, they got a letter. Now, how long ago was this? I think about 15 years ago. They got a letter from a man in Philadelphia who said he was doing research into Scottish nobility and he understood that the Campbells kind of figured in there in the Scottish aristocracy and he wanted to know who their ancestors were so he could look it up and he'd send them a free family tree. So Grace wrote down what she knew, what names of Campbell ancestors she was aware of and sent it off and didn't think any more of it until she got another letter from Philadelphia. It was in a big creamy envelope and she opened it up. On the outside was her name, but on the inside it said, Your Royal Highness. And it said, Today is the happiest day of my life as I greet my one true sovereign queen and went on to say that the Campbell family was the first in the royal line of succession of the House of Stuart, the royal family of Scotland. She passed it around to the children. They each read it carefully, as if it were made of spun gold, and if they dropped it, it would break into little pieces. And she was quiet a long time. And then she said, it may be true, or it might not be true, but we'll find out. But anyway, you're not to tell a soul about this, you understand? You don't tell anybody. You promise. They all promised. About a week later, this man in Philadelphia, whose name was D.B. Mackay, sent them another creamy envelope, and they opened it up, and there was a chart which unfolded and was bigger than their kitchen table. And it started way up here in the left-hand corner with King James the Seventh, and King James the Eighth, the old pretender, and Prince Charles. And it kind of got lost in there with a bunch of counts and marquises and aristocracy, but right down here in the lower right-hand corner, it certainly seemed to lead right to them. And there they were, the royal family of Scotland, living in Lake Wobegon, <laughs> in a green mobile home, with furniture donated by the Lutheran Church. They sat astounded, couldn't even talk. Here they were in their same dismal little place. But everything had changed. Everything had changed. They were different people. There were times in the weeks and months that followed that Walter wished he could tell somebody about it, that he was a prince of Scotland, especially to his cousin, Donna Marie, who lived in the house and who had all sorts of rules about who could and couldn't play in her backyard and what they had to do and what they had to say to her as if she was some kind of royalty. Well, someday Walter would stand revealed to her, would take off his old second-hand hand-me-down parka and would be a prince of Scotland. And she'd kneel down in the grass and beg his forgiveness, which he might or might not give her. <laughs> there was many a time they were tempted to tell. The letters kept coming from the man in Philadelphia, 
And one day he wrote one to Walter, which his mother read aloud to him several times. It said, Your Royal Highness, discovering you and your family has been the happiest accomplishment of my life. And if God in his infinite wisdom should deny me the opportunity to meet you face to face on this earth, I should still count myself the luckiest of men. For this chance, however small, to restore Scotland to her former greatness. Please know that you are in my thoughts and prayers every day and that I will work with every ounce of my being to restore you from your sad exile to the lands, the goods, and the reverence to which you, by the will of God, are entitled. Boy doesn't get a letter like that very often. <laughs> it was astounding. Well, people in town, of course, knew about these creamy envelopes coming to the Campbells, and they were so curious about it, they tried to pry it out of them. They tried to pry it out of the children. The children wouldn't tell. And people started to resent the fact that they had this secret. And one day Lawrence said to Grace, he said, you know, Grace, sometimes you act like you're too good to walk on the same ground with us. And that's when they decided to move to St. Paul. Lawrence packed a bunch of their old furniture in his trailer to give them a ride down here. But at the last minute, Grace said, take it off. I don't want to take that with me. That's not mine. That belongs to the church. Lawrence said, you might need it down there. She looked at him. She said, Lawrence, what I need in this life is style. And I need understanding and love. And I won't be carrying it with me from Lake Wobegon. I'm going to find it where I'm going. The children sat in the back seat of the car and looked out at the neighbors who'd come to look at them as they left town. And Marla sat there holding her dolls, Mr. and Mrs. Whippet, on her lap. And she said, someday, when we're crowned the royal family of Scotland, they'll have a big parade here in our honor. And I'm not coming. <laughs> well, they still live in St. Paul. Earl moved off. He got tired of the whole business. His mother made him sign a, a little document saying he relinquished all right to his line of succession there to the Scottish throne. But Marla, she still lives with her mother in the apartment up there a few blocks off Summit Avenue. And Walter does too. He's a student at college. He's about 22. Over the years, they've read all the history of Scotland and memorized the names of towns and places. And have studied over and over again the sad history of the House of Stuart from which they are descended. That the English and 1688 overthrew their true and rightful king, King James the Seventh, and they brought in a Dutchman, William of Orange. And when William and Mary did not have children to take over the throne, the Stuarts were waiting. They would have been glad to forgive the English and come back and be king and queen again, but no, they wouldn't do that. They sent up to Germany for some princes from the house of Hanover, brought them down and made them royalty over England and Scotland. And finally, in 1746, Bonnie Prince Charles came over from France all by himself and rallied his brave Highlanders behind him and marched south down into England and got a ways and then for some reason turned around and went back up. And finally, in April of that year at the Battle of Culloden, his hopes and his army were torn to shreds and the House of Stuart went over the hill into history. Whenever Grace saw an article about Queen Elizabeth or Prince Philip or Prince Charles in the paper, she was livid. <laughs> Usurpers. They called James the Eighth the old pretender. Look at these Germans sitting on the royal throne of Scotland. It's not right. Well, they got letter year after year, month after month from D.B. Mackay saying he was forming a committee for the restoration of the House of Stuart to the monarchy of Scotland and that it could be any time and they should prepare themselves. And so they did. 
That was what drove Earl off. <laughs> Mother making him stand and smile for hours at a time. <laughs> Got tired of it. But whenever their faith was low, whenever their faith was low that someday they'd be restored, Grace would turn to Walter and she'd say, Walter, tell us what it'll be like when we get the call. And he said, it'll come at 8.30 in the evening on a summer day and they will tell us to be on a plane the next morning and we'll be so excited we can't sleep and we'll get on the plane and we'll be exhausted but then we'll land in Glasgow and there'll be crowds, crowds of people and six men in blue pinstripe suits will get on from Scotland Yard and escort us to a helicopter and we will fly to Holyrood Castle on High Street in Edinburgh and we'll be led in to freshen up for a while and then we'll go up to the balcony and there will be the balustrade and there will be 13 microphones and there beyond it will be a hundred thousand Scots and we'll walk forward and speak. You do it, Walter. I'm too nervous. <laughs> he often thought what he would say. He might say something like, how much is all this costing? <laughs> or he might say, nice to see you. But he'd probably say something royal and fancy. Ah, oh, it was wonderful, year after year, to imagine being restored to the monarchy and going to Scotland and being king and queen and princes, though a little more modest than the Germans down in London, not needing a ship or all these jet planes or buying new dresses, going off to fancy balls, going off with actresses down to some island. We wouldn't need all that. <laughs> we'll be a good royal family. Well, it was this last week when they got the telegram from their father. It said, wire money, $500, need desperately. Signed, William. Grace didn't know what to do. Walter said, we'll wire him our phone number and he can call us. And three days later he did just that. Walter had never spoken to his father before and hardly recognized his voice at all except for the fact that it was so nervous and so halting. This is Walter, he said. Walter! How old are you? Twenty-four, Dad. My goodness, it doesn't seem that long ago. Well, it was. I get a year older every year, just like everybody else. <laughs> Walter, he said, I need money. He said, I don't need five hundred dollars. I need five thousand. I've been indicted for mail fraud. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong to hurt people but they want to put me away for 10, 15 years and Walter, I'm too old to go to prison. I got to leave the country. Walter said, what is it you did? He said, I was in the genealogy business. <laughs> I made up family trees for people. Walter just felt his face go numb. He said, you didn't. You did this to us. Why did you do this? His father said, I meant to tell you before this. I really meant to tell you. But it was meant as a gift. I wanted you to be proud. I knew those Tollefsons would pity you and pity you until there wasn't anything left. He said, I wanted you to be so proud that I wouldn't have to come back, that you'd come and get me. Well, they raised the money. Walter put down the phone and his mother said, you didn't tell him then that he's the king of Scotland. <laughs> Walter said, no, it'll be time to tell him later. She said, oh, Walter, what would I do without you? You're so strong. You're so good to me. She said, you're a prince, you know. They can put a crown on a dog and call it a prince, but you are a prince through and through, though nobody may know it now. They'll know it soon, and next year at this time, we'll be in Edinburgh with the bands playing and the flags flying and the crowds cheering.